What is that? It's an old-timey wagon wheel. I should make an old-timey knife out of it. This wagon wheel is a great opportunity to make an American Frontier trade knife I've been wanting to make since I saw the Revenant. It was advertised as being made of iron, but I found most sellers don't really know what they're selling, metallurgically speaking, so we're going to have to figure this out by some spark testing. Here you see a genuine wrought iron bar showing sparse sparks, no flowering or bursting. And here's our uh, wagon wheel. Also, not many sparks, but I see a few bursts every once in a while. I wonder if this wheel could be uh, mild steel instead of iron. Here's 1018 mild steel. A few more sparks in our wheel, one or two more bursts. And for reference, high carbon steel with many copious flowering sparks that leave no doubt that the carbon content is adequate for knife making. So which is our wheel? Well, it's closest to iron, but those rare bursting sparks bother me. This may be very low carbon mild steel instead of iron. In any case, we'll have to imbue it with more carbon if we're going to make a usable blade. So here we have baking soda. We're going to carburize our steel by transforming sodium bicarbonate to a sodium carbonate salt in the oven. We'll then combine that with graphite powder for our carbon source. Uh, for the purposes of case hardening or making blister steel, sodium and potassium carbonate are salts that are commonly combined with uh, a carbon to help uh, catalyze that reaction. In the industrial setting, they would use more toxic salts in some cases like barium or cyanide salts. Each piece will be uh, straightened out. Then we'll grind them clean before they go in the oven with a 70% graphite powder and 30% sodium carbonate mixture. So I'm a subscriber to Niels Provo, so I'll put a link to his channel in the description. And he actually does the same thing. I, di I didn't realize this, but he also makes a knife out of a wagon wheel. It's a different style knife, um, but I'll let you know he does it better than I do. Go check out his channel if you're interested in this type of project. Uh, he's pretty much the master. We're going to use a 3 16 inch square tube with the ends welded on it for an airtight container. If the container is exposed to high temperatures for enough time, uh, with the contents in it, blister steel will be made. And if the temperatures are not high enough, we'll end up with what looks like case hardening. I'm hoping for blister steel because that is the process pioneered uh, in Sheffield, England that made it the cutlery capital of Europe in the 17 and 1800s. In either event, we should be able to introduce enough carbon into the uh, thin metal strips to get steel adequate for knife making. It was baked for four hours at uh, 1900 degrees. It took a long time to heat up and it'll take a long time to cool down. This is the moment of truth. Do we make blister steel or case hardened steel? Do we make good steel at all? Definitely not blister steel. Well, let's spark it and uh, see what we got. So it's many more sparks and uh, more flowers and bursts than we saw in the original uh, wagon wheel steel. So I think we're on the right track. A billet is tack welded together, then attached to a handle, and the forge welding process will begin. Joining these pieces together will give us a single piece of steel large enough to forge a knife out of, as well as further homogenize the carbon that was taken up and concentrated in the outer, outer uh, one to two millimeters of each piece of wagon wheel. You guys have probably noticed the Digital Green Beetle logo and name sporadically in the video at this point. My videos are being stolen and re-uploaded frequently now, so I'm trying to curb that. I, I've begun to wonder if this is why Duresta puts his name on everything in his shop, so it's, uh, you know, the name's constantly on screen. So thank you for pointing out videos when you see them on other people's channels and uh, letting me know so I can have YouTube take them down. I, guys, I, I spent over four, 55 hours uh, shooting and editing this video. There were over 200 clips to look at, trim, edit, and join together. So uh, thank you guys for helping me with that and uh, keeping, keeping this thing going. So I'm not liking the feel of this at this point. It feels sort of crunchy and mushy. 
I'm gonna slow this down and take a look at what's going on. Oh, you're kidding me. Is that a crack? Is that a... Donald J. Trump! Yep, that was cast iron, or very close to it. We added too much carbon. It cracked and crumbled under high heat and would never be suitable for knife making. So we're back at it. Here's our second batch. We baked it for one and a half hours instead of four hours. I don't think I really took into account the amount of time it would take to heat up in the oven and then cool down in the original uh, process. So did we get enough carbon in there this time? It looks like it. There aren't as many sparks as last time, but they're still pretty bursty. Before we get too much further, let's check and make sure we're okay by quenching a piece in water for, for hardening and checking it with some files. Yeah, it comes in just under 65 HRC, I think. So in Sheffield, England, in the early 1700s, a clockmaker discovered the cementation process, uh, which is essentially the process of crucible steel in which iron was baked in these huge furnaces for days to a week at a time with this carbon-rich material um, to form blister steel. And the blister steel had these bubbles in it and, and um, was refined into sheer steel, at which point the importation of steel from Sweden ground to a halt and uh, the cutlery industry was born in Sheffield. By uh, 1800, a third of the knives produced in Sheffield were exported to the United States as, as trade knives, basically. They also came in from France, Spain, and Germany, particularly France, where knives from Saint Antienne, uh, the knife and gun manufacturing capital of France, uh, were common. American blacksmiths made knives, but um, I, I don't know of any examples on a commercial scale. I, I couldn't find any by searching, but uh, you know, maybe that happened, not in a significant way, I don't think. So here's our final billet, no cracks. I would like to forge weld it again, uh, you know, fold it and forge weld it, but we're losing steel fast and I need to have enough steel to make a knife, um, a large cartouche style knife when this is all said and done. I used three books for an up close look at trade knives. The first spent most of its time on the Bowie knife. The second one had a small amount of useful information in it, but believe it or not, this hand drawn sketchbook proved to have the most information. Uh, super cool book. So let me share what I learned. Uh, some of the earliest examples of these frontier trade knives have these upswept blades and tips and they were known as scalpers for ominous reasons, although they were really mostly used for uh, skinning and processing game. As time went by, the tip got lower, the spine got straighter, and the, the belly even sort of got trimmed away a little bit and we were left with what looks more like a chef knife or today's sort of modern knife. And this is more like what I'll be making. The tang, um, there were some hidden tangs, uh, some uh, half hidden tangs, but for the most part it seems like the tangs were visible on the outside of the knife. Here's a half tang drawing. The tang only went halfway through the handle and then uh, maybe even a third or quarter tang in some pictures that I found. And uh, as production went on, full tangs became a little more common it sounds like. So from the top, this is what that would look like, a, a, a pretty square handle in many cases, or octagon handle with a half tang running through it visible on top and bottom, and then the knife coming out here. The blades were long and thin in most cases, usually tapered. An eighth of an inch was, was pretty much the norm or thereabouts. The American West was not tamed by a, a quarter inch tang chopper, as it turns out. Here's some French and English examples. These are some full tang knives from a museum. And this is more like what I'll be making. This is a late style uh, trade knife that is often referred to as a cartouche knife, presumably named as such for their elongated capsule-like resemblance to the French military rifle cartridge called cartouches. Um, it said this knife was popular among fur traders. First step is to forge in the tip as always. So we're going to get that knocked down and shaped up.
we're gonna go to the tang now and my goal is here to have a six or seven inch blade with a two uh, maybe two and a half inch tang so we'll see what we get out of this As always, I'm going to hammer a curve in against the uh, edge or blade portion and that will straighten out as we hammer in bevels. I'm going to work on straightening it up in the vise here. Once the spine is straightened up, I'll chalk the uh, edge and we'll have a peek down it and make sure that it's straight with the spine and that there's no twists. In many cases there are twists and we have to do some work, but, but this time it turned out pretty good. So historically these knives apparently were well finished and polished and shaped. Um, I'm not I'm gonna skip some of that because I want mine to look a little bit aged I'm even gonna etch the blade for that effect and uh, that'll also help with uh, some rust preventing rust to some degree um, but uh, despite what you see in movies these things were uh, polished silver and um, well cared for in most cases if you can trust the interweb I don't know that's just what they say so we gotta find some wood for the handle it's time to go back to our wagon wheel uh, the outside is just not going to work. The, the curve on that radius is just too, uh, too great. We're not going to find a flat piece, so I'm going to look at these spokes. Some of them are pretty cracked, so I only have one or two I can really work with. I'm going to have to uh, get this right uh, pretty quick. I've never done this before, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. actually sands up pretty well. There's no real rot. It's, it's very dry and cracked, but um, I think overall the wood's in pretty decent shape. I'll be able to take side-by-side -side passes with the bandsaw and knock out part of this groove. But since I want this uh, fit to be nice and snug, I am going to have to file and sand the rest of it to shape. So we'll have to, uh, you know, cautiously proceed and check fit and proceed and check fit and so on. It pays off. So I have to drill pinholes, and I'm not excited about that because my handle material is already thin. There's going to be some splintering and chipping of the wood on the surface. So to prevent that from happening, I'm gluing two sacrificial pieces of wood on there, and then we'll drill the pinholes and, and cut off the uh, exterior pieces of wood. I thermal cycled this at 1,475 degrees three times and then quenched it from uh, about 1,520 degrees in Parks 50 oil. It hardened up well in water. That doesn't always mean it's going to harden in oil. So uh, we'll see what we get. And in this case, we have success. Yes, it was tempered three times at 400 degrees. I did discover some warping, which isn't too uncommon in blades this thin and long. So we clamped it uh, over some pins and kept the edge in water. And then we're heating the back of the spine, which uh, often straightens it.
Since the knife is hardened, we're going to use a fresh, clean, sharp belt to get this done without uh, any hassle. So this is me uh, trying a diamond file suggested in a forum post on the ABS website and after gouging the crap out of my blade it's back to the grinder and then some sandpaper to finish instead. I was uh, none too pleased with the diamond file idea. Maybe after some of the larger pieces wear off it won't gouge as badly but uh, that was definitely a disaster. <laughs> this is etching in ferric chloric acid. Again, we're going to sort of put that aged look on it a little bit, and uh, this will make it slightly more resistant to rust than it otherwise would be. Man, that looks pretty slick. I'm going to like this. We'll, we'll polish it up a little, take some of the black out of there, and, and make it look slightly fresher, but uh, I think this is going to turn out great. Let's go to war with that rusty axle. we got to make some handle pins. I'm already noticing some splitting at the end of this piece of metal. That is not a good sign. You can see it's sort of uh, worsening as we hammer on it more. So I decided to grind down and sure enough I think there's some stress fractures in this axle. So maybe this wheel actually was more than decorative. Maybe it was used at one point. But uh, that axle is not going to be usable to make a handle pin. So it's back to the tried and true uh, wagon wheel rim. We'll cut off a bit and uh, forge us some pins. can't forge it to the exact diameter we need so I'm gonna have to do some grinding and even this could get pretty spotty Got a little bit of work to do but man that uh, three-quarters of that is right that's pretty good I, I'm really shocked that I pulled this off Always dry fit. That's a pretty righteous fit. We're going to shape the handle a little bit, but these were usually pretty rectangular or, or maybe octagonal and blocky. As time progressed, I got a little rounder. You find everything all right? Yeah, actually I need something that I'll bind some cracks in wood and it will take stain. Take stain, eh? I know just the thing, buddy. Try this wood filler. It'll take on paint or stain. Are you sure this is a kind of important project? Oh yes, definitely. And by that I mean as soon as you leave, I'm definitely going to go flirt with a girl and paint and let her know I sold you something that will definitely not take stain or paint. Yeah, alright. So you notice my epoxy is sort of brown. I mix some sawdust from the grinder with a little bit of stain and put that in the epoxy to make it uh, brown and less glaring in the final project. You've probably guessed at this point that uh, the wood filler I use to patch those cracks does not ultimately take stain, which is a bit of a downer, but that's all right.
I made the mistake here taking the clamps off before painting the pins over and the result is that the wood opens up on one side about half a millimeter uh, pulls away from the tang. I'll show you more of that in just a minute. I had to mix some epoxy with some graphite powder and fill that in but it, it turned out looking pretty good. There's that filler. It looks aged. That's not the that's not the end of the world. And here's that little half millimeter area I was talking about. It filled up nicely with that gray epoxy. Um, so it, you you know you can tell something's a little off there, but it looks pretty good in the end, and it just looks like a, a patched up old trade knife. And it's still just rock solid. I really can't believe it turned out that good as far as the uh, lockup. So this has been one of my favorite knife builds of all times. I loved it. I had so much fun. I learned a lot. It didn't turn out perfect, but gosh, it looks great. It was a joy to make. So thank you for letting me share that with you guys. It is on eBay for 100% charity auction, so check the links below. Also, go to Neil's Provost channels if you never have, and have a good one.